How many people that are here today uh, want to start a business? And then how many people today don't want to start a business, have no interest? See, somebody always raises their hand. I can never figure that out. Like entrepreneurial lecture series. Like anyway, we're glad you're here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, hopefully I can share just some of the experiences that I had when I was a student that helped me get my business started um, and, and help you guys maybe see some opportunities. Okay, so first of all, I'll talk to you about uh, property solutions. So we founded in 2003. I got started with the business when I was a junior here at BYU. Um, I'm actually still a junior here at BYU. Actually, no, I'm a senior now. Um, I, in fact, I have to take this class to graduate still. And I think I've spoken in it maybe seven times now. So I think maybe I can petition to get credit for this. How many, like seven or eight times? How, okay, I'm, I'm seeing a thumbs up, this is good. Um, so we have offices in Provo and Lehigh. Um, we are the industry leader in the apartment industry for providing portals and payment systems. And uh, we have about, we have over 700 clients today, about 11,500 apartment communities, or about 4 million residents, apartment residents, that use our platform. Um, we've been recognized in the Inc. 500 for three or so years. Um, we've won a bunch of industry awards. Um, I wouldn't have put these in the presentation. Somebody else put, built this for me. <laughs> um, UV50, um, I think we were, um, with Deloitte, we were ranked the, the 40th fastest growing tech company in the U.S., which is pretty exciting. Um, all of my, my business career, while it started when I was younger, um, I did lawn mowing and actually painted when I was a college student. Um, right when I got home from my mission, I painted curbs. And I don't know if you guys have seen like house numbers on curbs. Um, but I started out um, going door to door, knocking and, and convincing people that emergency vehicles can't see your house at night. They can't see the numbers. So you really need these numbers on your curb. And I made like 40 or 50 bucks an hour. And so I would just go and work in the evenings for a couple of hours and um, life was good. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, when I first got back from my mission, um, I knew I wanted to do something besides inhale um, chlorofluorocarbons my whole life. And so I decided that uh, I wanted to get a business started. So I came and I took a class here at BYU. And the first day of the class, Rick, this guy named Rick Farr, who's the founder of the Center for Entrepreneurship, um, he taught the class. And so I came and I sat down. And the first thing that he taught in the class that first day, um, the topic was how to get a business started and how to come up with an idea specifically. And are there people here that want to start businesses but just can't seem to find the right idea? Raise your hand if you're in that boat. Okay, so quite a few people. So he said, <clears throat> the best way to find an idea is to look around at, the, the, you know, um, whether you're driving down the freeway or, you know, hanging out at your friend's house or whatever it is, look for opportunities to find where there's consumer pain and think of ways to solve that pain. And if you can do it in a way that, um, people will trade their money to get rid of that pain, then you've got a good business idea. Um, the, other, the other option is to um, find some unobtained pleasure uh, where somebody's, uh, somebody wants to experience some pleasure and if, if you can um, sell them a service and provide them that pleasure, then, then um, you have another viable business opportunity. So <clears throat> um, when I started thinking after the class, I'm like, what pain have I felt? Um, you know, what pain in the marketplace? So I was just literally just off the boat back from my mission. And um, so I started to think about um, receiving letters on my mission. I served in Honduras and it took like um, three weeks to get letters. And I think it's probably very similar now in terms of serving in a, in a foreign country and waiting to get letters. And so anyway, um, I, um, had no clue, like, why does it take three weeks to get letters to Honduras? And so I went and I researched and I found out that it only takes a couple of days to get letters to Honduras if you send it through normal mail. But if you use the church's pouch mail department, it just takes forever. And so I'm like, well, there's got to be something weird going on here. So I went up and I talked to the pouch mail department and I asked him, what is it that's taking so long to get these letters out? And they said, well, see, this is what happens. And they brought me in and they showed me like this huge vat of letters that come in. And they're, they're like, yeah, the, the letters all come in here 
if they get here by Thursday, then the next Tuesday, um, we need four or five days to sort all these letters and get them into mission, bundles of, by mission. And if we can get them all into bundles by mission by Tuesday, then we send out a, like a FedEx or a UPS package of letters to the various missions, um, which takes another like two to three days to get to the mission. And then it sits in the mission office for a week, usually, before it gets uh, circulated out to all the missionaries. So anyway, um, I was thinking about it. I'm like, so if you live in Florida and you send a letter on Monday and it doesn't make it to the pouch mail department by, by Thursday, then it won't go out for another 10 days to even go to the mission. So anyway, it's just like the system was completely flawed and broken and it was all because the church didn't have a mail sorter. And <clears throat> so anyway, I thought, well, hey, I can become the church's mail sorter. And so essentially, um, I, I launched this website and it was a brilliant business idea, right? Because I thought, you know, if I can let, uh, if I can get people to come to my website, and I'll, I'll let them submit their letters for free. And I'm going to take and I'm going to print these letters off for free. And I'm going to put them in envelopes for free. And I'm going to drive them out to, uh, up to Salt Lake for free and uh, drop them off. And man, I'm going to get rich. This is going to be an awesome idea. And so anyway, um, today you'll probably hear a few things that you shouldn't do. <laughs> so when you start a business, try to come up with a, a revenue model for your business. There's, there's countless numbers of web businesses that have started with no revenue model and they end up tanking. <clears throat> So anyway, um, long story short, we, we came up with this process where people could write their letters on Sunday night. Um, we'd print them off in order by mission, give them to the pouch department in order by mission so they didn't have to sort them, right? And by Tuesday, they'd get them in those packages. And on Thursday, they'd get to the mission home. So we shaved off almost a week of that latency in getting letters out. Um, we also opened up a service where you could write missionaries in the MTC. And uh, we would let them, you know, if they had their letters submitted on the website by nude, we would print it off, drop it off at the MTC, and the missionary could get their letter that afternoon. So again, we saved people a ton of time in, in that lag between getting letters. So anyway, um, <clears throat> we started, at the, at the time when we were starting the business, we, uh, my, my buddy Ben Zimmer and I, which is also one of my partners today in Property Solutions, um, we lived at the Glenwood, um, more affectionately referred to as the Glen Hood. And uh, this was one of our, uh, the Daily Universe came and took this photo right here of us starting our business. And uh, so you can see like the first original version of DearElder.com. Um, we bought a Lexmark, it wasn't, it, I don't know who put HP, but it was a Lexmark printer. They must have found that on Clipart Faster or something. Um, but it was a Lexmark printer, it cost $39. And um, we couldn't afford to pay anybody because we weren't charging anything for the service. And I was the elders quorum president at the time, so I just commanded the quorum to come and help do letters, and of course they obeyed. And so um, we we ended up uh, we ended up getting the business going. So um, the interesting thing, thing that happened when we um, when we first started advertising is we again we didn't have a lot of cash, and so we went up and we printed off handbills, and um, we put the handbills in the BYU computer lab. And we thought, you know, this is a great idea because they're sitting at the computer and, um, you know, we're going to plop down this, ha this handbill like right next to them and so maybe they'll, you know, write a letter. So anyway, we went and we did it and um, ran back to, to Glenwood and we started watching the system to see if people were going to submit a letter. And all of a sudden we started seeing letters come through. It's pretty exciting. Um, but then the weird thing is we could see the from address of these people that were writing and all of a sudden they started coming from Florida, New York. California, so all these different places, and it was um, word of mouth was spreading the concept. So that was the best thing that ever happened um, to Dear Elder is that we didn't have to spend a lot of money to market the business because it just spread by word of mouth. Um, uh, you know, today somebody mentioned that uh, you know their mom was saying, "Hey, you got to write people on Dear Elder." I mean, people put it in their ward bulletins, completely unsolicited from us, but it really the business kind of just took off and, and grew on its own, which is fantastic. Um, we did receive a uh, request shortly thereafter of dropping these handbills off not to um, flyer the, the computer labs anymore at BYU. So what did we do but started to flyer the parking lots, right? So that lasted about a week. And then we were asked not to, to do that anymore. And so we got this really great idea that we could print off 
these 10 foot like vinyl signs, advertisements for Deer Elder. And we could smuggle them into the football games. And every time BYU scored a touchdown, we'd unravel it and shake it up in the stands. And we'd get 65,000 people that would see these signs, right? That didn't last long either. So um, we started doing, um, we called up the Daily Universe, KBYU. They were all more than interested in coming and covering this neat little startup. Um, we uh, actually decided to pay and put mouse pads in the computer labs on campus. And so it was, it was legit on that one. And so we, we got the word out even more. Um, we started putting up billboards once the revenue started coming in. And then lastly, we decided to make a TV commercial. And this is big time, right? TV commercial. And so we were going to run it during LDS General Conference. And let me see if I can pull this up here. We had a budget of $300 for this bad boy. Let's see. Is it in IE? Firefox. Cool. So we found this. Uh, we found a couple of students up at BYU that were willing to do it for just uh, for free, basically, we just provided like craft services, and we found this uh, really cool-looking dude named John Heater. Cover simmer, simmer. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire. DearElder.com, writing your missionary just got easier. This one's from your sister. She's awesome. <laughs> so anyway, $300 budget on that, and we just got droves of traffic when we ran that. So, so anyway, Dear Elder was a really fun little business. Um, I, <clears throat> um, when I started the business, I uh, didn't have a lot of cash to get it going, and so I called up my, my sister, and I told her about this great business model of doing all this for free, right? And then afterwards told her I'm looking for a loan, and um, she quit, or, or not for a loan, but for an investment in the business. And uh, I needed a thousand bucks, and so she, she gave me the thousand bucks, but said she just wanted to be paid back. She did not want any ownership in the business. <laughs> and so, so anyway, she gave me a thousand bucks, and so the first thing that I did with it is um, I went out and I wanted to find somebody to help me build this website, right? So I went up and I found this guy on campus that was supposedly the genius building websites, and I paid him 300 bucks, which was a big chunk of that seed money. And um, it took about a week and a half or two weeks before I'd burned through the 300 bucks. And I had a logo, a really bad one, and a really bad looking homepage um, that didn't work. It was just HTML, it had no functionality. And um, so that's what I had to show for the first 300 bucks. So I'm thinking, there is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to pay somebody else to start this business or to, to code this, this website, I mean. So, <clears throat> so anyway, what I decided to do at that point was um, roll up my sleeves. I was going to have to learn it myself. And I was in, I was in my ISIS, I think, a 201 class at the time. And the first assignment in ISIS that semester, um, and again, I was the whole like email explosion happened while I was on my mission. So I came back and the first assignment was um, to uh, set up a Hotmail email account. And I remember, I remember thinking that I was so intimidated. I'm like, I have no clue how to do that. And so, so for me to figure out how to build a, a pretty you know, complex, you know, interactive, database-driven website was, was something that was pretty intimidating, right? So I'm curious today. Out of all the people in the room here, who knows how to code? That is awesome. So are you guys ISIS mostly? OK, that is so awesome. So if you go into a room of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and ask people to raise their hands if they know how to code, you'll get at least 50% of the people that are coders. These are the people starting businesses. And um, if you know how, if you have those technical capabilities, it unlocks your ability to get businesses started. You can be, you know, a scrub from, you know, Montana like me that grew up in a three-bedroom, 1,200-square-foot farmhouse with nine people, and you can still start a, a, a great business if you have the, the technical capability to do it yourself. 
Um, once you move beyond the do-it-yourself part, it, it helps you see technology from a different perspective and helps you be more adept at, at, at um, helping implement your product, um, knowing when a developer is telling you when they can't do it, if they really can or can't. Um, so there's a lot of benefits that, that you'll get no matter what discipline you go into, whether you start a business, whether you go work for some company. Um, having a technical proficiency and being able to understand how to code, it just it, it changes the way you think. And so I strongly recommend it to any of you who are thinking about it. Um, it's not, it's not a, a necessity, but it's probably the, I took Computer Science 142, and it was the best class that I took um, as a student at BYU. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so dearelder.com, um, in 2001, we processed 88,000 letters. Um, by 2008, we'd processed 450,000. And as of 2010, we'd processed 2.1 million. And we're at, like, I think 2.7 million letters now that we've done. Um, we did it for free, <clears throat> um, every single letter that we've, we've ever printed. Um, <clears throat> we do charge if it's not through pouch or MTC, we charge just for the postage. Um, we always wanted the service to be free, but that was not a sustainable business model. And so I went and um, went to the Center for Entrepreneurship um, back in the day. And I sat down with a guy named Steve Gibson, who some of you may know. And uh, Steve, you know, sat down. He, he had me tell him about it, my, my business model. And he said, hey, he's like, you're never going to make this happen unless you can find a way to, to generate revenue. And so he said, you've got to do something different. So anyway, we sat down. We started brainstorming. And we figured out maybe we can sell cookies and care packages and, and advertising. So, so anyway, we started doing that. The business started generating revenue. And thank goodness... Um, I, you know, for that because uh, at the time uh, um, I was in the process of trying to talk my wife into marrying me, and uh, so I got the I think I got the revenue of the business up to about three hundred dollars a month, which paid for my honeymoon, which is a great thing, and and the business even grew from there. And uh, but um, as I was um, struggling with getting this website up and running, um, I went around and I, I asked a number of different web design companies if, uh, um, if, if they would let me come work for them for free to, to get the, the website started and, and learn how to, to develop it. And so I finally found this place up in Alpine after talking to about 10 different companies that, that helped me, uh, you know, I think I worked for them for about four months, learned how to do server-side scripting, um, took Computer Science 142 at the same time, took a JavaScript class, um, built the site, um, got it up and running, and, uh, and was able to, to, to make that business profitable. Um, as I was doing that, I found out that I was truly passionate and just fell in love with, with um, SaaS, so software as a service, and um, being able to automate processes through the web. And again, this was pretty early for that. This was in 2001. And this is kind of a you know brand spanking new concept. Um, <clears throat> my wife at the time, so I talked her into marrying me finally, and um, I uh, would bring her lunch. Um, she worked at Centennial Apartments over on Ninth East. You guys probably know where that's at. And um, I'd bring her in and bring her lunch. And I was building this website, Dear Elder, and just automating everything to the hilt, trying to make it as you know, I, I was going to school full time. I didn't have time um, to, you know, spend any more time than I absolutely had to to run the business. And so just automated everything. And my wife, um, as I was at Centennial eating lunch with her, I'd see people come in, this big apartment community, right? And people come in to pay their rent. And she would pull out these paper ledgers out of this file cabinet, slap them down on the desk, and then take the check, put it in a little box with a key, and... Um, write on, on these ledgers what the rent was that this person had paid. And it was just mind-boggling to me that this big, you know, very you know, successful business, that this huge asset, um, would be using such antiquated technology. And so, again, going back to this idea that I had of, um, that was shared with me about looking for pain and, and finding opportunity to solve it, the idea of property solutions popped into my mind. So... Um, Having kind of, I, I wrote a business plan for Dear Elder in the business plan competition um, the year prior, and um, I remember I went in to talk with one of the professors to let him look at the business plan, and again, it was everything's free, no revenue model whatsoever, 
And he, he looked at me. It was the day before uh, the, the entry was due for the business plan. And he looked at me, and I could just see it in his eyes that I had zero chance of winning <laughs> or even, like, making it into, you know, semifinals or anything. And so I was determined from that point forward to find a better business model and, and represent um, a different business plan. So we um, came across this idea for property solutions. Um, we launched the business, um, got, it, got it kind of up and running just in a, in a basic state, and um, wrote a business plan. Um, the, the concept for the business plan was basically um, build software for apartment communities. And that was everything from accounting to websites to payment processing and so forth. Um, the value proposition was um, that the software would be web-based. Um, we'd have real-time data transfer. So when a resident logged in to pay their rent, it would instantly update the ledger in the accounting system. Um, anybody could have access to it anywhere on the internet. Um, standard kind of SaaS model stuff. Um, and then we'd completely do away with paper ledger and receipts. Um, Today we have a process where a prospect can go to one of our portals, um, so a prospective renter, they can go to one of our portals, express interest, submit a lead, um, eventually fill out an online application, have their credit screened, um, execute a, a digital lease agreement, um, and move into the property, go through a, an online move-in process on a kiosk in the apartment community. Um, once they're up for renewal, they can do the whole renewal process online as well. So we've built a technology that completely eliminates paper at the site. Um, we put this business plan um, in the business plan competition. Um, we ended up winning first place here at BYU, which we got 25 grand in cash. Uh, we got another 25,000 in accounting services and um, a number of different services. Um, we uh, after winning the BYU competition, you become eligible to compete in some of these national competitions. And so one of the national competitions at the time that was of interest to the school was called the MBA Showdown. And it was a competition that was sponsored by Fortune Magazine. And so we, uh, you know, called up and we said, hey, we want to, we wanna, you know, submit into the, the competition. And they, they told us, well, you guys are undergrads. You can't compete in this. And we told them, well, we, we you know, beat the MBAs at, at BYU. We should be able to enroll. And they told us, no way. So we went and talked to Ned Hill, who was the dean at the time of the Marriott School. And he gave him a call and strong-armed him. And uh, um, we got a call back the next day that we'd be, uh, that we're able to submit into the competition. So anyway, um, we submitted a business plan, kind of doctored it up, like raised our pro formas a little bit, you know. Um, and submitted it in um, to the, this Fortune Magazine competition. And um, long story short, we ended up winning the Fortune Magazine, the national competition. Um, we got $50,000 in seed capital from that, so we ended up with a total of about 75 grand in cash. And uh, we had everything we needed to really start hiring programmers and, and get, it, get the business off the ground. So here's a few photos. We, we flew out to New York City and uh, received the award check for that. Um, so, Property Solutions, the company started at that point. Um, after all these uh, rich founders of the Center for Entrepreneurship gave us their money, they, they wanted to see us get something started, so we felt pretty obligated by that point. Um, so, one of the things that's always been important for us at Property Solutions is just culture. And um, we've, done, we've done a lot to evolve that over the years. And... Um, I'm just going to show, I don't think I have enough time to get through everything today, but I just want to show like a few things. I'll show like a clip of uh, the, the big dodgeball thing that we did, um, a few other things. <clears throat> and then we're supposed to have Q&A at the end, is that right? Ten minutes? So you can go until uh, ten before the hour, and then from 3 to 3.30 we'll be doing Q&A in this class. So. Oh, so I have 22 more minutes. Okay, sweet. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'll just click on a few of these because I don't think we have time for everything, but... Um, so Property Solutions, we bootstrapped the company, just like we did Dear Elder. Um, on a much bigger scale, though, we bootstrapped it. Um, we, we raised in total about $800,000 to get the business up and running. Um, we haven't raised any money since 2005, um, so we've grown completely organically from that point. Um, we, with $800,000 in capital, um, we've grown our revenue to 
In 2011, we did 11 million in revenue. In 2000, sorry, in 2010, we did 11 million. In 2011, we did 19 million in revenue. Um, so we, we've had really significant revenue growth without any capital infusion. Um, so our original investors have about a 40x multiple on their money right now, and um, based off a, a recent valuation that we did. And um, we're thinking there's another 40x available in growth for our company in the next like seven to eight years. So for every one dollar they invested, it looks like sixteen hundred dollars in return, which is just absolutely outrageous. And um, that's one thing that I just wanted to comment on really quick is how you guys capitalize your businesses. So I think a lot of people make a lot of mistakes in the way that they capitalize um, their companies. And um, it's everybody's dream to go out and get you know this VC capital infusion and oh now we can start the business and getting it going and get it going. But really, I think capital in a lot of ways harms businesses early on. And again, it depends on your business model. But if you take more cash than you, than you absolutely need, it's, it's, it damages your company because you end up overspending. Um, you overhire. You spend things on frivolous. You spend money on frivolous things that you don't really need. Um, you inflate your expense structure. And if things don't grow as fast as ideally you think that they should, then you end up going back to the trough, to the VCs, to, to uh, raise more money, and you end up diluting yourselves out of your companies. I've seen it over and over and again, over and over again with good friends of mine. Where I, I had a friend that, I mean, he put his own money in in the first round. He put several hundred thousand dollars into a company. And he owned, um, I th he, he got down to the point where he owned 0.25% of his company um, because he had down rounds. And in down rounds, you just get decimated. So um, don't, don't be too flighty to go out and look for capital. Um, when you're looking for business ideas, look for opportunities where you can start it. Like, even today, like if I'm evaluating a business opportunity, it's all based on how much capital would, would it take to, to get this business up and running. And um, I, sh I, I had a, so before the Redbox thing, I actually wrote a business plan on creating DVD rental machines, because they had them in Europe. And, but the capital costs of starting that business was so huge, because you had to buy all that equipment and buy all those DVDs and stock them, that I just wanted nothing to do with it. And so look, look for business opportunities where you can start really efficiently and scale efficiently. Um, enterprise software um, is, you know, everybody wants to, you know, start some sexy, like, iPhone app, or they want to, um, you know, start the next social networking site or whatever it is. And um, enterprise software is a huge area that maybe isn't quite as sexy, but it's an opportunity, it's a place where I guarantee you, if you have entrepreneurial tendencies, you're willing to roll up your sleeves and learn to code, guarantee you, you can be a multimillionaire going into enterprise software. Just find some industry that needs to automate a post to Craigslist or um, whatever it is, ridiculous things, and, and go into those spaces, start those businesses, and you can just easily create um, very, very you know, um, high cash flowing businesses. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, with property solutions, because we bootstrapped the business and uh, we constantly had to look for opportunities to do things on the cheap and get our name out there on the cheap. And so we went out and there was this, there's this um, apartment association trade show called the National Apartment Association that we go to every year. There's like, it's the biggest trade show in the industry. And there's like 500 companies that come to exhibit every year. And so um, we, our company, we have, um, we're kind of known as the, the dancers. So like we'll get out, and I don't know, it's probably our, our Utah culture rubbing in, but we get out and they have this kind of like dance party um, where mo the whole industry is kind of just wallflowers until they get a little inebriated and then they start like dancing and having fun. And it's on Thursday night um, of this week of this um, association trade show. And so property solutions, like we just get out there and we're, you, every year we're just kind of going nuts and having fun and people know us as a company for that. And so one year we thought, well, hey, let's, you know, what if we, what if we hired um, some break dancers to come out? And we have a very distinct outfit that we wear. It's like a white shirt with a skinny red tie. And so we're like, what if we hired some break dancers to come out and, uh, you know, while we're just kind of dancing around having a good time, these guys start doing crazy stuff, spinning on their head and 
So anyway, we found this um, group called the Knuckleheads. I don't know if any of you have heard of them, but they're down in Vegas, and they're like national championship break dancers. And uh, so anyway, we hired them, and um, we had, and I'll show you a video here in a minute, but um, we had them come in and just dress up like us, just wear the white shirts, the skinny ties. And so we're out there just having a good time, you know, and then all of a sudden these guys start doing like some, some kind of funky stuff, and people are like, whoa, you know, what's going on? There's like 5,000 people, right, in this huge auditorium. And so anyway, um, people start to get interested. They're coming over and they're looking, and then all of a sudden they just bust out all these windmills and they're spinning on their head. And um, anyway, we had, um, we paid these guys like $800 to come do this. And we had like 3,000 people just like watching these guys dance for like an hour and a half straight in like all property solutions gear, like these really distinct <laughs> outfits. So since we did that trade show, at that time we, so in our industry we have these like companies, we call them the top 50. So they're the 50 largest apartment operators in the US. And when we did this show, we had one of those top 50 companies. And today we have 25 of the 50 largest companies. So we've just grown like mad. And a lot of it is just because of grassroots marketing. It's not because we spent a lot of money um, it's uh, just getting out there, creating a brand, creating a reputation, and we've just been able to grow like crazy because of it. So again, you don't need tons of capital, you just need to be creative. <clears throat> so um, this last year, uh, another one of the kind of just harebrained things we did um, locally and, and we so um, one of the things that our company does is we we process rent payments and um, so last month we processed 456 million dollars in rent payments so like a lot we process a lot of rent and people are logging into our portals and making the rent payments and so we decided to launch this um, donation platform so our clients could let their renters um, make donations to whatever charities they wanted um, through our system. We'd process all these charitable donations at no cost, settle them to the companies and let them match those donations and give it out to some charity. So we ended up raising a lot of money, but we, we actually, so we threw this dodgeball, charity dodgeball event um, to promote this new donation system that we built into our system. So <clears throat> we, we decided to do this, um, try to break the world record for the largest dodgeball game, and um, we took donations at it, and were able to raise, I think, $11,000 for this charity called Camp Kesem, um, which is uh, it's a camp that they put on for kids whose parents are terminally ill with cancer. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we decided to hold the event up at Thanksgiving Point at Electric Park, and the max capacity was about 4,000 people. And we needed, um, I think, I, we needed 3,000 people to break the world record for the largest, largest dodgeball game ever. So anyway, we put a ton of like work and planning into it to try to draw that many people in. And all afternoon, I, did anybody here go to that, that game? Okay. So do you guys remember the afternoon of the event? Like what? It rained hard. I mean, it was like torrential rain. I, I don't know if I've ever seen it rain that hard in Utah before. And the skies were just over, overcast and nasty. And so we thought for sure it was going to be a complete flop. And so <clears throat> about a half an hour before it started, <clears throat> um, we, just, we were talking. We're like, we just need to call it off. You know, we, we, we can't do it in this weather. And we had, like, band, like outdoor bands and, like, you know, all this st um, stereo equipment. And um, we'd ordered, like, 4,000 J-Dogs or something like that. Um, to come for, just to cater it. And um, anyway, so we're, we were like, well, let's just do it. It'll be fun, whatever. And so um, we went forward with it, and it stopped raining about a half an hour before the event, and we ended up with 4,200 people. So we were completely over capacity on it. Um, and it just, it was, it was super fun, and we had a great time. But, um, but anyway, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and chat with you. Hopefully, some of you will be able to stick around for the QA session. Um, I, uh, I wish you all luck with uh, getting your venture started. There's, there's so much opportunity, you guys, here at BYU to get your businesses started right now. So don't wait. Go work with the Center for Entrepreneurship. Get involved in the classes and the lecture series. Obviously, you're already here for the lecture series. But um, sign up for the business plan competitions. Sign up for the SEOY. Um, go to all the events. It, it's um, so much 
easier to start your businesses now than it is to wait till you're 30 or 35 and have experience, which, you know, experience is great, but um, it's the, the fire in your belly is what gets, gets businesses started. So if you have it, get it started now. Thank you. <clears throat>